today on Wednesdays with Willa, I've got a very special topic for you. <laughs> I can't wait to introduce this one, folks. Um, this is Wednesdays with Willa. It's my weekly podcast that airs on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern on my Facebook page, Willa White Medium. And I typically have a special guest on the show, and we talk about a spiritual topic relating to either spiritualism, mediumship, healing, faith, family, or more. And this is one of those more topics as well as being part of the mediumship world. And I have with me today, Shannon Taggart. Hello, Shannon. Hey, hi, how are you, Willa? Good, good. I'm glad to have you back on the show again. And for those of you who don't know who Shannon Taggart is, she has been coming to Lilydale for decades. And she is a wonderful artist and the author of the book, seance. So I encourage you to look back at the archive videos of the show uh, where Shannon and I have talked about uh, her book, Seance, which features uh, wonderful photographs of trans and physical mediums and uh, things to do with spiritualism. And uh, you know, she has been such an advocate for Lily Dell in bringing great programming in the summer uh, to our summer program season. So I'm glad to have her on the show today because we're going to talk about Michael Jackson. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Michael Jackson and the mediums. And what a, what a great topic. I know a lot of folks are really excited about tuning in for this one because, you know, celebrities have their own kind of draw, absolutely. And he's such uh, an amazing kind of bigger than life uh, personality from uh, just a few decades ago, right? And it's something that I know you're going to bring a lot of great information to the show today. And I want to make sure everybody understands this goes uh, on my Facebook page, Willow White Medium, and also will go on to my YouTube channel, as well as going out on blogtalkradio.com slash Lilydale Radio. This is part of the Lilydale Radio family, and there are other shows in the Lilydale uh, radio that you can tune into uh, throughout the week. All right, Shannon, let's get into our topic for today, Michael Jackson and the mediums. Yes. Um, so yeah, I know that this is a topic that doesn't often get associated with spiritualism, but I was drawn to the topic of Michael Jackson through my work with different mediums. And why we're talking about this today is because I actually gave this presentation about Michael this summer in Lilydale as part of um, my annual symposium. And there's a venue in London called the Last Tuesday Society that's hosting some of those, some of the programming I've brought to Lilydale. They wanted to see and they wanted to know about Lilydale. So th those will, there'll be online Zoom programs throughout this spring with me hosting. Um, with a number of the amazing speakers I brought to Lilydale, and uh, I will be giving the Michael Jackson talk first, so we can find out about all that stuff on my website. But so why I was drawn to Michael Jackson is while I was working on my book Seance, I encountered a number of mediums who claimed they were in contact with the spirit of Michael Jackson, either mentally or bringing him through in seances. I met mediums who sing, sing as Michael or brought him into the dark room seance and said he was dancing. And I, I started to think, well, why Michael, why has Michael Jackson become so popular with all of these mediums? Even the Long Island medium in one of her books writes about contact with, with Michael and, and what he told her after he passed. And I went online and saw tons of different uh, practitioners of all of all paths, not just spiritualism, online posting these YouTube videos about contact with Michael. And I thought, you know, why, why is he so popular? And that made me kind of investigate his life and think about him. And it, his, his existence in many ways is just truly like looking through a hall of mirrors. It's, he's, um, researching his life and his spirituality as well. Uh, it's very confusing and fascinating and hard to know what's going on. And there's a lot of parallels with him. And 
you know, mythological gods or shamans or mediums. He had his own mediumistic experiences, which he spoke about. He consulted uh, spiritualist mediums during his life. He was famously had his own system of healing, which he taught, taught to children to have them self heal. And so there's a lot of unexpected connections between Michael and spiritualism that I draw out throughout this presentation. It's fascinating, truly fascinating that he would have that those kind of levels of understanding and, and the, the tie in with the mediums of today, so to speak. So tell us more about some of those experiences. Uh, well, I, you know, I, for my research in for the book Seance, I spent a lot of time with physical mediums. And so I was um, in seances where uh, the medium brought in Michael Jackson and sang as Michael. Um, one had him come dance, like I had mentioned before. And so, and there was, I was noticing spirit art about uh, Michael, specifically with a medium I worked with a lot named Sylvia Howard. And I started to research the history of celebrity and mediumship because it wasn't just Michael too. I have to say, there are a lot of contemporary, in contemporary times, some of the most popular uh, celebrities who appear in seances are Freddie Mercury, uh, Louis Armstrong. Um, the, there's a British presenter named Quentin Crisp who appears kind of a lot. And I noticed a lot of famous mediums from the past reported experiences with celebrities, although those were different celebrities. Sure. Like, for example, when, when spiritualism first began, the one of the most popular spirits was Benjamin Franklin. He appeared in a seance with Kate Fox. He came to the, the spiritualist Isaac Post and helped, and Isaac Post wrote a channeled introduction to his own work through the spirit of Benjamin Franklin. Um, he also was involved with one of the most sensational stories in early spiritualism, the creation of the new motor with the, with the John Murray Spear, uh, which was this incredible device, spiritual device that was built, uh, channeled through scientists. And so, I mean, so that was early on, you know, and then as the eras go, I, I noticed it was a common thing. And I, I am curious, you being a medium, Willa, what, how do you feel? I, and I, I am very interested and I asked, have asked other mediums, sure. do you ever get celebrities? Do people ask for them? What do you think of all of this celebrity interaction with from the other side? So <laughs> I, I would have to say that uh, there are occasionally, there will be people who ask for celebrities and I'm you know, not really into to doing that. However, they have come in, um, they've been sneaky. <laughs> like, like, like literally it came through in, in a reading and I said it and I'm, I'm connecting with this man. He's Abraham Lincoln tall. And, and went on to describe, you know, so sometimes they have to sneak past me in that sense. And um, the, the man, the gentleman I was doing the reading for was just like, he was gobsmacked because he was just like, I'm actually researching Abraham Lincoln right now. And I have been feeling his spirit with me. It, like, it was just like, it was, it was monumental for him in terms of proof. And that's happened before, even with people who are scientists, sometimes their, their favorite scientists will come through and I'm like, I, like, I'm not trying to, <laughs> like, I'm not trying to connect with somebody like Michael Jackson or, you know, those kind of folks. I, it, it'll just sort of happen. And, um, they will verify oh yeah you're absolutely connecting with this particular person who's famous is a famous author or a famous scientist famous politician famous musician and it's not like i'm trying to though i i don't uh crave uh those that kind of attention as it were <laughs> yeah yeah it's a curious thing and um 
another big celebrity, which I who I have to mention involved in this is Elvis. Yes, that's what people ask for. <laughs> oh, people ask for Elvis? People ask for Elvis, and I'm like, you know, I'm not really. <laughs> that's so Raymond Moody, the the, re, the afterlife researcher who coined the term near-death experience. Mm -hmm. When he was first writing his famous book, Life After Death, he had so many reports about experiences with the spirit of Elvis that he actually saved those and combined it into a, a separate book. And it's called Elvis Afterlife. I highly recommend it. It's a fascinating book. I've encountered mediums who um, have been in touch with Elvis. There's a, in my book, there is a, a piece about a woman named Myra Basie in England who she does automatic writing with Elvis. And so she it, it's she considers it a form of physical mediumship where um, she lets her hand go and he writes. And uh, I had asked um, Lilydale medium Lauren Thibodeau when I was doing my book, have you ever had celebrity experiences or what or you know what has happened? And she said, well, yeah, there was this one time this I was giving a reading and I kept getting Elvis and I would I said, no, that's that's not she kept, you know, throwing it out. And then the third time she's like, I'm sorry, I this doesn't happen often and I'm not I don't try to do this, but I have Elvis here. And it turned out that the the person who was getting the reading, her mother was his housekeeper. Uh <laughs> See, I, I like to do it if there's actual personal connection with the client, because yeah. I'm trying to focus on their family and friends that have passed over, not just like random people that decided to walk through. And so they would have to have that kind of connection. Yeah. But I can see how initially you'd be like, no, no, Elvis is in the building. You know, like, it's just I know because, yeah. and I mean, maybe it is because these celebrities live in our mind in such a powerful way that it, that's how it gets drawn in. I really don't understand it, but I am really, truly fascinated with that connection and what it means and um, why, it, why it happens and why it's important to people. I, I, you know, the, the, the whole celebrity culture phenomena is, you know, it's a big part of culture. It is, and, and people can get quite obsessive about their favorite celebrities and, you know, almost think in terms of tabloid yeah. covers of things. And, and uh, it's, you know, I, I guess I, there's a part of me that really feels for celebrities because I, I tend to be more of a private person. I can't imagine being in the spotlight to that degree and complete lack of privacy and people wanting you and me, you know, needing bits of your clothing or whatever. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, it's, that is, um, I touch on this in the, in the presentation because Michael Jackson is even today, he's likely the, um, the pinnacle of human celebrity, yeah. you know, throughout history. I, I mean, Yes, there are people who are incredibly famous in, in the past, but they didn't have the hot media of television and magazines and and all of that which was surrounding him. And I have quotes from different people who worked with him about what it was like to be in the streets with him. And it was like people would just drop to their knees and cry. Like the 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 accounts of what it was like to encounter him sound like Jesus or or other holy people throughout history and he often Michael Jackson often compared himself to Jesus and he he also he oddly identified with um people like the elephant man yes. because he he considered himself a true freak and that he also says in his autobiography that he was the loneliest person in the world or he felt that he was and that he had a hard time connecting with people. That's why he also had a lot of intense relationships with animals. And as we remember, you know, you may remember him in Bubbles. Yes, the chimpanzee. So, <laughs> but that kind of a relationship between man and animal is actually an aspect of spirituality as well. 
And so I get into that and talk about that. And I'm in him and bubbles that that story, it, it, as with anything, it's hard to know what is true and what is false in all aspects of his life. And he, he purposely added to that, like, Oh, I think he totally did. He knew how to work the sensationalism of things. Yeah. But supposedly his, his sister in a documentary, his sister Latoya says that Michael wanted to actually speak with Bubbles and he was consulting teams of doctors to see if they could reposition um, his larynx. And so, because like chimps can't speak because of where that's positioned. Position. So he was trying to find a medical team who would take that on and nobody would, uh, whether that's true or not, that's what Latoya has said on camera. So, yeah, but I mean, he, he had all really, he had a menagerie of animals. He actually, his first hit song was a song named Ben and it was a love song to a rat. Yeah, I, it's just, and it's fascinating to watch the, his relationship with animals progress throughout his life, you know, to the end where he, you know, in Thriller, he's got a tiger on him, you know, on the cover of Thriller. Like once you start to notice these things about him, you, you, you can see them throughout his life. Well, he didn't have to uh, be someone for them in particular, yeah. like you would for a human. It's easy. It's easy. I, I feel for most people when they're animal people and they love, it's easier for them with animals than humans. Yeah. And the, the, the unconditional people, love they feel. Yeah. And, and that kind of segues to the most controversial topic of his life, which is uh, his relationships with children. Yeah. And it is really, I, so in the presentation, I, I try to show all the confusion about that aspect of his life and I'm not arguing like as a mother I am not I would not sit here and say I don't find his activity with children strange I mean I I you, you know there were parents who just like left their kids with him for not even knowing him and just left left them there for days like his uh, it's and why would a grown man want to do that and but at the same time, if you look into the legal, it's very complicated. They could not convict him on any of that stuff. And mm -hmm. there are children like Macaulay Culkin or Corey, uh, Corey Feldman who spent time with him as children who say he was the opposite of a molester. That uh, Corey Feldman in his book talks about how he was familiar with pedophilia from working in the film industry and that Michael Jackson actually helped heal him from those experiences. So it's like a very strange thing to say about somebody who then is also accused of the same crime. And so that's why even as, you know, that, that aspect of his life gets incredibly complicated and I don't know what to make of it. I just tried to um, discuss how, what, what we know or what we can't know what what has been said and what has what contradicts what has been said so it's kind of like trying to do an archaeological dig on his life to some yeah. extent yeah. i mean you have someone who very much like um like the uh people who were in charge of the mayan and incan and aztec empires and, and they got to a point where they would only live at the top of the pyramid right and yeah. they really it was very difficult for them to have any connection with any of the lower downs mm -hmm. because of that and there's a loneliness being at the top mm -hmm. of that kind of world and and put into the position of a god an uh, you know a, the god like figure that he has become like you yeah. saying people dropping to their knees it's like Beatlemania gone to another level yeah i mean even even celebrities would speak about how they were like madonna herself she said she'd have to pinch herself and remind herself that he was human things like that like what is going on with Michael Jackson? I, I when there was that Men in Black movie where they made sure they flashed his his face up on the screen as an alien. 
yeah. That's a good connection too. Um, because he he talked about UFO experiences and he claimed he saw a UFO over the North Pole um, when he was flying. And um, there is there's some connection there. It's also really hard to know, like I said, what is true and what is false. And all, the problem with researching him is in the later era of his life, it's hard to find anything other than the, about the child's uh, mm. cases. Mm. So he wasn't often speaking about his other things, you know. Um, so it, and there's, I mean, I could, I wish I, you know, you could spend your whole year researching Michael Jackson and still just have new threads to, sure. of research to go down. It's like every aspect of his life is like a hall of mirrors. And I, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also overwhelming. So in, in my presentation, I, it's basically a, it's a sketch of questions and kind of pointing to things about how he is, he is both black and white, child, adult, yes. male, female, yes. you know, the man, animal, even one of the most fascinating things I discovered is he, his blurring of the states of awake and asleep. Mm. Because Ooh, tell that when he died, um, the, uh, like a Harvard uh, doctor testified at the, the manslaughter trial that he is one of the only human beings we've uh, we know that went 60 days without REM sleep because he was not, he was, you know, there was, he had hired this doctor, Conrad Murray, and he was taking propofol, which is an anesthetic. And it was being administered in his home, which is absolutely unheard of. This is something that people get for surgery, um, you know, in a, in a hospital setting. Mm -hmm. So he was getting, so he wasn't sleeping. He was going into a coma at night at, for 60, while he was rehearsing his big comeback, mm -hmm. you know? So, and when you go into this propofol state or, you know, this induced coma state, mm -hmm. you're not sleeping, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting REM, you're in another space. And I kind of question or draw draw some material together to raise the question of why was he doing this? Was he doing this to get rest? And I would argue he was doing it for creative inspiration because he, he talked a lot about getting his um, songs and dreams or from God. Like he always said his, his work came from God. It wasn't, it was hard to put his name on it because it just came to him already there. And there's a quote that I discovered from Deepak Chopra, who was friends with Michael. And he said, mm -hmm. Michael had asked him, had he ever heard of this substance that took you to the valley of death? And Deepak Chopra said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, I think he was talking about this propofol, that he was able to access another realm when he was on it. And then I found another quote that was in Entertainment Weekly that said he would come, you know, after he would get up in the morning, he would come to the set and be like, I have all these ideas. And every day it was new ideas he was coming with. And finally the director said, you know, we got to stop with the ideas. We have to put this into motion. And Michael said, well, you know, my, my ideas are coming from God. And if you don't use them, he's going to give them to Prince. <laughs> Oh, yeah, because there was a competition between the two of them. I think he, at, at one point, because I I tried to pick up a book in advance of this at yeah. the library, and it said that that he had tried to do a duet with Prince, but he didn't respect Prince because Prince was bad with women or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, it, and if you, if you think about it, um, Prince was the only celebrity who came close to challenging him in any sort of charismatic or, you know, that type of level of interest way, I think. And so it was, he was the closest that he had to a rival. Yeah. And um, in the presentation there, there was uh, this page from the National Enquirer that um, 
uh, that was Michael Jackson's favorite false story about himself, which is Prince using ESP to drive Bubbles mad. <laughs> yeah, I think he, he fed stories. On yes, purpose. he yeah. absolutely did. He was um, he was inspired by P.T. Barnum and the autobiography of P.T. Barnum. He had his whole entire staff read that. It became his strategy. So when you, in the late eighties, when you see uh, these stories about him sleeping in a, a chamber, um, you know, mm -hmm. like the, I forget what kind of a chamber it was, but the, mm -hmm. the, the chamber to prevent aging or him buying the elephant man's bones. Those were stories Michael himself planted in the media and then, and then rallied against. I mean, then they, they created this wacko Jacko persona that then he fought against. Mm -hmm. And then he, there's, he's got a video called Leave Me Alone where he, he's, you know, dissing the tabloids, but the, and they, the, the headlines flash in the video, but they're all stories that he planted himself about himself. So he's a very, very confusing, fascinating character. And, and people are still, celebrities still try to work that today in, the, in yeah. the same manner. There are others that are doing, using these kinds of tactics, if you yeah. will, the, the yeah. showmanship. And, and I wanted to ask you about the fact that he, uh, you know, he's soft-spoken you know, if you were to just talk to him like that, right? But then he would go and his little, burr, you know, like power performances and he kind of was angry. There's an anger that seemed to come out of some of his performances later on. Yeah, supposedly the voice was fake, that he actually had a masculine voice and he was able to make his voice that way. Mm -hmm. But then there's other rumors um, that he was, and I'm forgetting the term, but that he was castrated by his parents at, in puberty so that his voice would remain um, that, that feminine, you know, because m the male voice changes quite a bit during um, puberty. But that, that's a tradition that was, they used to do to the young male opera singers. Yes. And, um, you know, there are people who claim, like, I think it's Conrad Murray, the, the, the doctor who was, charged uh, for manslaughter for his death. I think he's he's publicly claimed that he was, oh, castrado, a castrado, that he was uh, castrated uh, by his family. And th then there are many who discount that as, you know, that's just a story. A story. But it, I mean, it, it goes, it's the folklore of Michael Jackson. It's, yeah. so that's why when I'm doing this research, I'm, I'm not, trying to discern what is true or false. I'm trying to draw from what is out there and create this picture of the mythology that surrounds him because there is no other way to do it, really. I mean, you'd have to embrace everything about him, which, you know, since his death, too, there's been a lot of news reports about seeing him in the clouds or in reflections or... Um, There'll yeah. probably be some toast showing up with his face on it. Yeah, something. yes. Like <laughs> similar, you're exactly right. Similar to the Marian visions. Yeah. They are, there are, I have a series of slides that I show the image of Michael being reported in a very similar manner. I have, I have another question. So what do you feel the one, the, the one glove thing symbolizes? Ah. Okay, I actually I have just I have a theory that okay. I present in the in the presentation. So I was watching there was an ABC special about the anniversary of his death. It may, it may have been like the tenth anniversary of his death or something like that. And they were interviewing his costumers. So he had a there was it was a male couple that had that had done all of his you know stage clothing for a number of years. And it's Diane Sawyer is interviewing them. And she says, you know, how did you choose what to dress him in for his, for the coffin? Or, or the, her first question is, how would you describe Michael Jackson's personal style? And without missing a beat, they both say on cue, Liberace goes to war. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so hilarious. 
because he did have all this military garment of all jewels. Um, so, so then she says, so how did you decide what would be his final outfit? And was he buried with the white glove? And they said, oh no, he was not buried with the white glove. That glove represents the song, Billie Jean. And so I'm thinking, what does that mean? And so then I did a deep dive into the meaning of Billie Jean and what I've discerned, or, you know, my theory is that, you know, the song Billie Jean is what made Michael a superstar. Oh yeah. That was and, the moonwalk, right? Wasn't yes, that and that was, the, he talks about Billie Jean, you know, it came as a download in his head when he was traveling in a Rolls Royce on a highway and the song comes to him or he had, it had already come to him that he was, he was playing in his mind at this point and the, the Rolls Royce sets on fire and he has to be, you know, motorists like waving, like you're on fire. And so that happens. And then he performs the song Billie Jean at live for the first time at the Motown 25th anniversary. And that's the first time he does the moonwalk and he's wearing the white glove and he had been wearing the white glove off and on since the seventies, but nobody noticed until this, this Billie Jean yes. performance. And so everyone himself and his critics and people around him all cite this moment as the moment Jackson, Jackson went from a pop star to the superstar that he became, you know, this one performance of Billie Jean. Mm -hmm. And so then he's in this new stratosphere, right? And thriller and all this, and this lasts for eight months. And then another strange thing happens when he's doing a performance of Billie Jean, he's doing it for a Pepsi commercial. Oh, yeah. And he starts on fire again and doesn't know he's on fire. And he goes down, descends an entire staircase with his head aflame. And it gets put out, but he had insane damage to his scalp. It, he had to have many surgeries. You know, it, it, later in life, he's wearing wigs and stuff. I, I, like, it's, it was, he was, um, you know, really damaged by that fire and then you know he he was not into drugs or anything like that or plastic surgery or like that that kind of marks the you know the downfall and so i don't know what this means it's a synchronicity though that he starts on fire twice with this song that has mm -hmm. been given to him from the gods according to him mm -hmm. and you know i don't know what to say about it other than to observe it um but yeah so the the glove to michael represented the song billy jean according to his even though color. even though he'd been wearing it on and off before that song right but nobody yeah but then it became it kind of became a symbol of his transformation mm -hmm. this idea and, of the phoenix yeah yeah right. yes. and, um, and then to ash but he really was only in that perfect stratosphere of superstardom for eight months because then all the problems start after the pepsi um tragedy you know i would say that was you know hugely tragic yeah he's the king of pop and he's also the king of pop soda <laughs> so yeah and then there's a lot of theories of like well he was doing um he was selling out for money and ads and his, it, you know, there is, there is some, a lot of talk about how he was heavily pressured into doing that for his brothers. So his brothers would make money because he had separated from the Jackson five. He started out with the Jackson fives from his brothers and that he was pressured into doing these, uh, doing this whole tour with them, to make them money. And, you know, there's a lot of, family drama with him and his his family and money and well i think that's he maneuvered at the 25th motown anniversary thing he he said he didn't want to do it he didn't want to do that show but he they said please please come do the show he says i'll do it if i could do a solo and that's when that all happened right yes yes and because 
Billie yeah. Jean was not a Motown song. Right. It's like, what is that doing there? Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> he's, he's actually blasting out of Motown by yeah. doing that song. Yeah. And so, so certain artists will do that. Let's say they they were country and then all of a sudden here they are at rock, you know, pop rock or whatever. You know, they People will change a, a genre uh, almost kind of deliberately thumbing nose at a certain thing. And that's what he did, I think. I think. So can, can we talk about the, the fact that um, the king of pop uh, for a while there was married to the king of rock's daughter, that yes. dynastic uh, transitioning of power? Yes, um, Lisa Marie. So yeah. um, Michael, I, I talk about this too in the presentation, how it was shortly after um, the first accusations by there was two court cases so the the, the first court case um with accusations from a child's parents um right after he courted I, she was married at the time i think lisa marie she got a divorce to marry michael they get married uh, many people might remember images of them on stage at an mtv awards kissing and everybody thinking it wasn't believable and thinking it was kind of gross and seeing them together and being like, no, this is not a true pairing. And, you know, I, I, I felt that way too, that it was, they didn't seem like truly married or it seemed like it was a publicity stunt or what was the real story there. But I kind of changed my mind on that. Uh, when I, I dug up this interview with Lisa Marie and Oprah Winfrey, mm -hmm. and this is after he died, and Oprah is kind of interviewing her about the marriage and saying, you know, was it a real marriage? I, and Lisa Marie said, being around Michael Jackson made me feel higher than any drug I've ever taken. And she said, the only person I've ever encountered who was like that was my father. And so you can you can see then it immediately becomes believable. Mm, mm. You know, that she was attracted to him because he reminded of her, her of her father. And that and she said in every way it was a normal marriage and we were trying to have children. But she was afraid that if they did have children, that and then they got divorced that he would keep them from her or there was some she was you know she was concerned about that and he's very powerful kind of, he's very powerful at that point yeah right so it kind of put the kibosh and there was i think but she claims that they were trying to conceive a child and that um it was normal in every way a marriage would be so then that leads me to another question since we, you know, we've been talking about Michael Jackson, but also the mediums that connect with him. Have any mediums connected with Elvis and Michael Jackson and or, and has Elvis said, I didn't want my daughter married to Michael Jackson? I, <laughs> I don't know. Like that, like, you know, that, that sense of sometimes people in spirit, they are opinionated. Of yeah. what we understand about things. I have not encountered that, but I'm certain there must be a medium out there who <laughs> who can comment on that. And sure. I mean, a lot, uh, a lot of times, you know. So I've been giving this talk or this, you know, I don't. It's a visual presentation on Michael, and um, it's evolved over time. But since 2013, I've been um, doing this, and many times mediums in the audience have come up to me after and said, Michael really likes that he, he was, he gave me a message to give to you that he really likes your, he really likes your presentation. And he likes that. Oh, I've had, I've had that experience, but I've never heard from Elvis about what he thinks. Because sometimes people in spirit, like connect as a medium, connecting to someone's loved ones in spirit, they're grandma can say one thing and their father can say another, and they don't necessarily agree. Yeah about things yeah. and I, I I don't know to me that's even more proof because they're like oh absolutely that's exactly how they were and it, you know so to me that's where evidence if you will or, yeah. or true communication from spirit 
you know, not everything is just, oh, we all get along. <laughs> you know, people have maintained their personality. So it, you know, back to this idea of him being this mythical figure, this idea of people saying, well, I, I have my connection that I've had with Jesus or Buddha or whatever. And, and now there's these, there are people that are, you know, have, have this connection with this, this mythical, mystical Michael Jackson. What are your thoughts about that? Putting him into that category seems a bit much to me personally. Yeah. I mean, I guess, it also depends on what your faith is. You mm -hmm. know, I've met people who believe that there are things like demigods and that, um, you, you know, and that, that's why I would associate him with the idea of a saint is mm -hmm. because in Catholicism, which I was raised Catholic, um, saints have power and you can speak to them and pray to them and they can, they can help you. They can, you know, they can take on your, your prayer and so what and, help have people reported Michael Jackson giving them from spirit side of life? Has anybody come forward with any like, oh, I felt the spirit of Michael Jackson with me and he helped me in such a way? Um, well, there's there's this new religion kind of starting around him, which I don't know too much about, but it's a kind of a religious movement and they call it Mike. There's one aspect of it called Michaeling where they go to a spot and they imitate him. And, oh, right. And so Interesting. I, that is one aspect I have to get more um, information on, but uh, there, there are, you know, cause there's a lot of like these sites around the world that act as Oh God, like memorials, but like people go there and remember him. And uh, there's one in Germany and I forget why that spot is super special to Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. um, but there are people who believe that, yeah, he works like a saint and that. But in he, what particular way does he help them? Does he help them with music or does he help them with some other aspect of their life? Um. I don't know if they pray to him or or how Michael works in their well, life. What do they I expect him to do that they couldn't get from praying to let's say God. <laughs> like, you, know, it's I, like, you know what I'm trying to say? Like what is it that Yeah, well, I mean a saint or a demigod god might intercede. You that know? they that what how in what way do they want that him to intercede, I guess is my question. Uh, I don't know, because that, that is one aspect I haven't researched thoroughly. Yeah, so that would be neat to know whether they expect him to, you know, drop in and have a talk with their parents and everything. Yeah, or if he, you know, as, as, or if he's completed any miracles for people. Yes. Or healings. Um, that's an interesting aspect that I have to look into more. So by and large, the way he's come through to mediums, he's come through as the entertainer basically mm -hmm. yeah. the understanding of he hasn't come through as the the animal communicator per se he's come through as the entertainer let's sing let's dance let's mimic that yeah the yeah. entertaining behavior would you say yeah yeah okay. that's a, 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 but i mean i don't know there's the mediums who claim like i mentioned the long island medium and she says that he came and told her details about his life that prove that he he was not guilty of the accusations against him you know there's that also um oh yeah his uh brothers i have quotes from his brothers that say that whenever he comes to them whenever they sing um there's oh there was an album yeah i forgot about this this is in the presentation where you know after he died you know he is the highest grossing dead celebrity that, but I had read that he did that. He bought up song. He he knew how to make it so he would get as much money back as he could from his songs, but also by purchasing songs. And yeah, he bought the them. Beatles catalog. Yes, yeah. Um, but you know, after he died, there was a, a album released called Escape, okay. that was material that was never released when he was alive, and 
they there was a team on it and one of the producers was a producer named Timberland and there's I have quotes from him from entertainment no not I, so, uh, some popular magazine where he says the spirit of Michael Jackson came in the room told him what to do he heard it with his own ears um and that he's not crazy and that it really happened and that he came to him to help him make the album and you know I don't know okay, so in his in that case it was actually a creative force that Michael Jackson wanted to be a part of yeah they said yeah and I mean yes. you remember the hologram oh that, yeah yeah that, so yes they brought him back uh you know the whole album was this attempt to invoke the spirit of Michael Jackson and they literally made a 3d construction of him with this hologram yeah and by doing that the people who were involved also experienced like something real as well so it's just very very interesting especially in the day and age now that we you know things have sped out so much with technology that you can actually a video can be made of michael jackson speaking as if he was right now like, yeah, you know, the the people are able to do that on a technology front. Yeah, and there's quotes from him that he never wanted to die. He wanted to live forever and that he believed he could live forever through film. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that towards the end of his life, he was trying to do more film work, more film projects. Um, and yeah, that, that was so one of... The whole thing was, you know, people would say Elvis isn't dead. He didn't die. No, he's not dead. And there's that idea with Michael Jackson too. This idea, oh, he's not dead. Yes, he's and dead. actually, he's not really dead. It's all fake. They're both alive somehow. There's, you know, there has been some, you know, with a lot of the conspiracy theories that are going around now. Um, some something that is involved with that is celebrities who are actually alive and did not die and so michael plays into that as well the whole um that whole phenomena of that that's happening right now uh i do know michael is one of the celebrities that they say is still alive so do you so at that at that point it's like well then these mediums that say that they've been in connection with michael and yeah, he's alive. So there's all this, this idea of the mythology of when somebody gets so big, somebody gets uh, bigger than life, right? Like Elvis has and like Michael Jackson and, and like an Egyptian God per se, right? Mm -hmm. um, the idea of getting so, so big that they, they cannot die to some extent. It's, it's that idea of they, somehow they can transcend death. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that's like their archetypal power because they start to represent principles or ideas or things that exist in the world, and then they become that that symbolic of that. Sure. Well, so. it's really fascinating. Any last thoughts? I I know we've covered a lot of ground. Any last th thoughts? Um, um, either relating to the mediumship portion of the Michael Jackson understanding or the spiritualist understanding, because I. I know you, you, you're going to have a lot that you're going to share in your lecture. We should announce actually right now the date. The date of that is uh, January, what is it, 20? 25th. 25th. And they can uh, get access to that, purchase a ticket to it through your website. Is that right? Yeah. Um, you can go to shannontigert.com mm -hmm. backslash events. Um, mm -hmm. And the first thing that pops up is that that event. And if you scroll down, you will see links to the other Lilydale uh, presentations that are happening throughout the spring. And if you scroll down from that, you'll even see a sneak preview of what will happen this summer in Lilydale, the, the yes. schedule for the live symposium. So all of that is at shannontaggart.com backslash events. Great. So people can can get the full lecture from you because I mean, we're just drawing from yeah. a few pieces from for today's uh, episode, but you, you're going to really go in depth. And I know you're, you all do pictures and explain about things. 
I think it's going to be a great presentation. People should probably try to tune in for. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. You've been building it over the years. Yeah. And I mean, just talking about this gives me, oh, yeah, I, I should add this and that. It just keeps growing and changing every time I, every time I do this presentation. Sure. Well, I know you, you'd been, when uh, we were off camera, you were talking about how this relates into spiritualism as well. Just if you can tell people a little bit about that, that'd be great too. Um, well, I, with the connection of the celebrities um, through, through, throughout history, throughout mediumship and him being this contemporary fasc fascinating figure, um, he also uh, consulted spiritualist mediums and was a healer and did hands-on healing he had his own system i think i mentioned that earlier he also considered himself to be clairvoyant mm. and i do um in the presentation i give the all the examples i could find of that him publicly stating um his own experience of clairvoyance how, how many uh, approximately if you had to guess of oh, instances uh, were you able to um i I probably have three distinct examples, plus a long um, piece about how he channeled his art. Mm -hmm. So you could classify him as a spirit artist, uh, the way that spiritualists classify spirit art, the way he speaks about it. Mm -hmm. And even the, the opening quote of Moonwalker, he quotes... Thomas Edison and who I know is important in who was interested in spiritualism himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he also quotes John Lennon saying that he's like a medium mm -hmm. being, you know, th this musician, he is like a medium. So there are points within Michael Jackson's creative work where he compares himself to a medium and describes it as you know, a form of spirit art, a form of channeled work, you know, so you could very much view him with that lens as well. Certainly. Now, I, you know, he has children and they're grown up since. Yeah. Is there any um, understanding that they've had connection with their father in spirit? Because I, I imagine I that's pretty private. They're pretty private and yeah, I haven't not in the limelight like they're in the father i haven't run across a lot of that stuff i think the most public one is his daughter paris mm -hmm. um but i haven't i don't know too much about the children i don't think they speak about their personal life too much i haven't i haven't run against or like across anything like that i mean i do it would be incredible to interview one of his siblings sure. or something but and i've always i have since I began, I had, a, I didn't know anybody who had ever met him. And I met a woman who was a video maker who made one of his videos, oh, wow. um, randomly met her in an event. And I said, what was it like to be around him? And she said, you know, you're going to laugh. But when I was around him, the only way I could describe it, it was like, there's like electricity in the air, like static electricity, you like you could feel. And she said, I told my husband that and he made fun of me and laughed at me and said I was being absurd. But then, you know, I saw this interview with his longtime makeup artist and she said the same thing. Every time she was in a room with him, she could feel like static electricity. You could feel um, the energy around him. So, yeah, like his his personal charisma or his like, for lack of a better term, like supernatural presence. Sure. um is an aspect i would love to hear more about i would also just love to get comments from people who knew him more intimately but you know that's impossible right now so i'll just <laughs> soldier on with the project you have been able to glean from all these different sources and yeah i think it's a it's it's wonderful you have the array of the historical autobiographical and biographical standpoint and i mean there are a lot of court documents you could sift through and interviews you could sift through but that you have access to the mediums that have also connected in with him so you have the 
the the during the archaeological dig of that and then beyond and how he's shaped possibly shaping things uh in the time to come yeah i just heard i mean speaking of the legal documents i just heard uh found a quote from megan kelly the you know oh. the former the broadcaster yes 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 um, mm -hmm. yeah she there was a clip of her recently talking about how she what became fascinated by the case and actually read all the legal paperwork from his molestation cases and she believes he was innocent so and that there's stuff like that that comes out that's like what how could that, that you know how could that be that i mean she's a lawyer she's trained sure. as a lawyer and um she went she was so curious she read all the documents which you know I don't know if she she's never done a program. This is like a quote I found from her. Yeah, it might, might be something that it'll, she's working on. So, I mean, like you, there will be other people that are also working on different aspects of Michael Jackson. Yeah. Um, the myth, the man legend, as it were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the, I mean, he's a million things at once. And that's kind of what the whole project is about. Like, uh, that he's like this flickering ball of opposites that you can't take your eyes off of and mm -hmm. he's definitely one of the I think the most unique humans I've ever encountered in um in life you know so well I, I just really appreciate you coming on the show today and explaining about those things and letting us uh banter about Michael Jackson today and and his it, diving into some of of his spiritual aspect and you know there's that gritty humanness that everybody will have and uh it'll be rare that somebody has this level of celebrity and and reach shall we say but yeah. I, I do feel it's a combination of that magnetism that he was able to develop that to that level of the static electricity but uh, there's that understanding that there's this um homage that people will the nod that they'll give to Michael Jackson in their life in the here and the now. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. And I encourage people to take a look um, and maybe sign up for, for Shannon's presentation because it's just around the corner folks and you want to make sure you get a, a ticket and reserve your spot so that you can enjoy her full, full presentation <laughs> regarding Michael Jackson and uh, look forward to having you on the program for the summer as well and uh, again go to shannontaggart.com for more information oh before I sign off today I need to mention to to everybody I'll be starting up my um, Monday night mediumship development circles again on uh, January 31st so you can go ahead and sign up on my website willowwhite.com I also have some uh, video lessons that you you can uh, ha have viewing access to until January 16th. So those are things that you'll want to take a look at on my website, willowwhite.com. And for more episodes of Wednesdays with Willa, tune in uh, to my Facebook page, like, share, follow on Willa White Medium. Have a beautiful week, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>